So good morning, guys. We are live. Welcome to Environmental Social Justice. We have Yay. our special guest today, Mr. John Marish, who is a three-time mayor of the city of Beverly Hills, as well as existing councilman. So thank you for joining us, John. We greatly appreciate it. Um, Joy Langford, who is our in-house environmental consultant and expert in policy and government and stuff I know nothing about. And Mr. Good Joel morning. Van Dent, and Mr. Joel Van Dent, our in-house realtor, who also knows a ton about solar and renewable energies with respect to commercial and residential construction. So that being said, welcome, John. Thank you so much. I appreciate you joining us. We did have a bit of a previous discussion before we went live. What just a wealth of knowledge. So John has done amazing things for the city, primarily banned all fracking in the city of Beverly Hills. And I believe to the state, it's it's still the only city in the state that bans fracking. Right. I you, think there are cities that may have moratoriums, but we are the only city, I believe, that, that has a permanent ban on fracking. Which is excellent. I'm not a big fan of fracking. Um, I don't think it's the right thing to do just for a multitude of reasons. And then autonomous vehicles, which you were one of the first people to jump on board autonomous vehicles. And how is that going right now with the city? Because I know with the pandemic and things slowing down, maybe it's on hold. <laughs> well, I, it, it's a vision. It's a vision for not just autonomous vehicles, but for using autonomous vehicles as a form of public transportation. Specifically, there are challenges, as we know, to the first and last mile. We're going to be getting a couple of subway stations in Beverly Hills. How do you get to and from them? They don't have parking there, which is a plus and a minus. Um, so if you don't live within walking distance, how do you get there? And the notion of a municipal autonomous shuttle system that would be on demand, um, and uh, uh, that would be something I think that would solve that. You know, the, the problem with public transportation in the United States or in, in Southern California today is it's not convenient. It takes too much time. People use it not because they want to, but because they have to. And when I lived in Sweden, when I lived in Sweden, I, I almost always in Stockholm, almost always use public transportation because it's convenient and it basically will get you to where you want to go more quickly than if you wanted to drive. And so to me, the true democratization of public transportation is indeed when people use it because they want to and not because they have to. And I'm a big fan of public transport living in Boston, New York for 20 years. I wish we had more access to it here, but just the way the cities are built, it's a little bit different. But one, go ahead. I was gonna say LA is a very, Southern California is very unique. It's not sort of a, a you know, a spoke and hub uh, kind of model. It's, it, it's, it's a very Southern California, and that's what a lot of people don't recognize, is, is a very unique situation where you have a lot of communities that are interconnected. And so I don't think that, that the solution is to try to turn us into Boston or Chicago or New York, but it's to try to take our strengths and to build upon that. And I do think autonomous vehicles as a form of public transportation is one way of doing that. I also think that um, work from home or remote work is, is going to be something that will be of tremendous benefit to the region. And I'm so glad you transitioned us into that because we were discussing that right before we went live. And we had a huge discussion about remote work. And Joel and Joy both brought up very valiant points about companies that are supporting the work from home and companies that are not. And one of the things that Joel brought up was some companies that say you can work from home, but your salary is going to get cut because you now live in Idaho instead of, you know, New York City or, you know, San Francisco Bay. And so you know, talking about the obsession with growth, the obsession of, you know, bursting from the seams of these hub cities. You had some very good points if you could just share with the rest of the group. We, we had a wonderful conversation right before we went live. So if we could just dive right back into that. Well, I, I think what we have now in, in America in general, and again, this is sort of our obsession with consumerism and wanting more and growth. And we have a number of, of areas, if you will, super winners where you have an over-concentration of opportunity. Uh, Silicon Valley would be one of them, Southern California perhaps, and, and it, there's just too much. And it would be much better for the state, for the country, and for the region itself if there were a deconcentration of this opportunity, if it were spread out, if we would, and I, I look at this from a very Swedish perspective. I, I, I lived in Sweden for many years. I'm, I'm a Swedish citizen and I'm very much informed by Swedish values. And in Sweden, there is a, this philosophy 
there's a, a, a saying that they have, hey, la lam, that's Galeva, which means basically the whole country should thrive, the whole country should live. And so it shouldn't just be divided up into, you know, winners and losers. And you've got cities and, uh, and areas in the country that are withering on the vine who have tremendous potential now if we would allow them to benefit from the new paradigm that we have, work from home, work from anywhere. And yes. I don't think people, people, move, people move to the Bay Area or Southern California. Sure, it's a great place to live, but many people love their own communities. And many people in the past have moved because they have to, because that's where the opportunities are. If we can share opportunities, create economic balance and geographic equity, then the whole country can thrive. Then, you know, I, 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 I think there, there is this movement that they, they call themselves the Yindis or Windies or whatever. And, you know, their notion is that we should just keep building, 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 and we should over concentrate opportunity. And that notion is that we're going to help people in Dayton, Ohio, by allowing them to move here. And that to me is completely flawed. I believe people in Dayton, Ohio, many of them love their own communities and want to stay there. And I bet you if you ask my friend Nan Whaley, who's the mayor of Dayton, Ohio, if we, we would help them or we would best help them by allowing their residents to move here, she and a lot of her neighbors would say no. But they would yes. like opportunities. If people love their city and, and don't have the opportunities now, and there are a lot of Rust Belt cities that have lost opportunity, including big ones like Detroit and Cleveland that have the potential to be completely revitalized. You know, housing is not expensive there. Uh, people have the opportunity to pick the kind of housing they want. It can be ultra dense if that's for you. But also, let's face it, there is in our state, there is a war on homes with gardens going on. There is literally a war on single family homes, which many of these groups consider to be immoral and racist and evil and that sort of thing. And that's just absurd. It's a lifestyle choice. Um, and, and so I, I look at the potential of, of remote work to allow the whole country or more of the country to thrive and to stop this sort of megalopolises or megatropolises that we have that literally are in a sense like the urban version of black holes sucking in everything. And there's no reason that we can't, you know, as, as, as we all know, people make places. They're, you know, look at Phoenix. What's so inherently wonderful about Phoenix? the middle of the desert, but there are universities, there's culture that, you know, we have made places that people feel that they want to be at home and we could do that anywhere. And in fact, there's some wonderful cities throughout the state, whether it's Visalia or Bakersfield or Fresno or Stockton that have their own right to exist as their own communities. And that shouldn't just be perhaps mega commuting areas for people who want to commute to LA or the Bay area, but can be on their own wonderful places to live and that's what we should be focusing on i agree i absolutely agree with what you're saying i know that um joel you're heavily involved in real estate obviously <laughs> you're and i know that you have opinions about high density housing and we do have a housing shortage joy often works with housing shortage and homelessness so i'm going to let you two comment on your beliefs and that starting with uh joel since you're the realtor in this Ooh, this is a very it's a difficult subject to comment on to be honest with you because i do understand that I get where John is coming from, but I think we have to look at the systemic issues that got us to the location that we're at now. Um, you know, because when you have the large areas with the garden areas, I mean, if you go back in time and you start pulling preliminary titles for all these places, they were set up to not allow certain people to live there. And so you had these areas that were wide open spaces that were geared towards a very certain section of our population. And the more condensed as you know, other neighborhoods where you see tighter populations, smaller lots, and the denser population was geared towards everybody else. And so I think, you know, the I think the backlash is kind of stemming from, again, it's learning the error of your ways, where we, this was kind of a situation that was created based on certain, I'll just say racism and stereotypes. I mean, because whether it was not people not being allowed to be by there or redlining, you know, through lending where they would only allow certain populations to buy in certain areas created this, a lot of this problem. So, I mean, you know, you go in certain neighborhoods, you've got the wide open spaces where people were given the opportunity to invest in and really build wealth. Certain people and segments in our population were not allowed to do that. So there is backlash, I think, towards the big garden areas, not necessarily towards people having it, but I think as we're kind of realizing the inequity that happened over time. 
And I hate saying that we'll be getting woke to it, but we are getting what we are realizing the error of our ways. And so, you know, you look at some like what's going on now with, with COVID, it's, you know, LA is a hotspot because we have serious poverty and we have a lot of multifamilies under one roof. Would that still be there today? Would we be in the situation today if 30, 40, 50 years ago, people were allowed to buy in these larger areas and do whatever they wanted? Who knows? So, I mean, it's kind of a lot of things are just kind of coming to light. And then there are a lot of things that just are are, are just standing, correct? Like pe- everybody, uh, rich, poor, black, white, people want to congregate toward a beach, to yeah. a warm climate, to Beverly Hills, to shop, to, you know, people, there are certain places people, you know, naturally want to be. Hollywood, make your dreams come true. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, there, so... With, with that being said, I think that there's also going to be uh, an even um, more diverse shift as to where people are going to actually go. You know, everybody's saying, oh, you can move to Idaho. Then people end up moving, you know, right back. Uh, we have the whole transportation thing that John was speaking of. You know, how is Metro, the, the Metro line going through Beverly Hills going to turn out now that there's going to be less people in transit um, going anywhere? Um, that might just have been an expensive um, experiment that, you know, won't go anywhere. Just like the bullet train coming back and forth. Transportation, uh, as it relates to, you know, eco, uh, being eco-friendly, um, it's it's going to change. There's lots of shifts. I'd be curious to see what the shifts are in, in car buying habits. Um, there's just going to be a lot of things. And I think a lot of, of, of people's paychecks, uh, whether they're taken back from the company or whether they're, um, you know, they, they just are making more or making less, uh, it's going to dictate how things go uh, for us in the future. Well, it's so funny that you bring up the public transportation. I never even owned a car until I moved to California. I mean, mm-hmm. I grew up on the East Coast, Boston, D.C. You didn't need a car. You don't so, you need one. You know, and so but I remember when they widened the 405, if you, you know, well, I don't remember how many years ago that was, but they did it. I think there was a study that said only, you know, if they did like a monorail or if they did something down it, only you one. <laughs> they did a, sur- a survey, only one in 10, one person out of 10 would be willing to get, get rid of their car to use that. So it's like, you know, they want they're actually, they're actually now, they're looking now to do either heavy rail or a monorail through the Sepulveda Pass, which would cost $10 billion. Yeah. Now, the question is, if we use that money to upgrade high speed Internet and to give it to everybody, would that maybe be money better spent? Yes. We need to be looking at new paradigms. I agree not, with the remote. I'm not saying we shouldn't have public public uh, transportation. We need it, but it needs to be, you know, you do that Google Maps test where you can enter in and I'll do that occasionally any destination and, you know, I'll do Dodger Stadium or Disneyland or something, you know, and it'll take you even with heavy traffic, maybe 45 minutes to get somewhere. But if you want public transportation, take two and a half hours. Nobody's going to do that. And so if you can do the Google test and it gets you to within 15 percent or something like that of where you get with a car or like in London, maybe even more quickly, people will use public transportation. But I, I wanted to get back to something, uh, Joel, that you mentioned in this whole notion in the discussion of the housing shortage, which, again, it's all relative. We, we I think we have a uh, an issue when it comes to affordability. Oh, the definitely. State, the, the state has. But but that's very different from saying there's a housing shortage or crisis. There are one point two million vacant units in the state. One point two million, according to Freddie Mac, which is, you know, the quasi governmental agency housing giant. California has a housing deficit of 820,000. So do the math. I mean, the problem is that when you see homeless people in front of luxury condos that are empty, that is a disgrace. And that's part of the problem that we have. You're very right when we we should look at the racist history of zoning. Beverly Hills, my city, is an example. You know, our city purchased a, uh, a house for our water infrastructure maybe a year ago. And it said, you know, can't sell to, there was a covenant on there, can't sell to Jews or blacks. Mm -hmm. Well, in the meantime, Beverly Hills is one of the only Jewish majority cities outside of Israel. So for me, the remedy is, of course, um, 
when it comes to restrictive covenants is not to say we're going to eliminate single family homes because in fact most americans of all colors stripes dancing skills ethnicities like ha that's their dream is having a home that's the american dream so it's not you don't eliminate single family neighborhoods you eliminate the racism think of it when it came to public transportation public transportation has a racist history just think of rosa parks blacks couldn't, couldn't travel in the same part of a or use the same facilities as whites? Well, the answer wasn't, well, let's get rid of public transportation. It's racist, it's inherently racist. It's you get rid of those practices. Same thing with elections. There are currently, there's voter suppression, which is race-based. Well, the answer isn't you get rid of elections, it's you fix them. And so, so my feeling is that we should allow people to have that kind of choice. So if there were people, and remember that slums were the densest area of town traditionally, that's one of the reasons diseases spread and all of that, so if there were groups who were hamstrung in their ability to choose their neighborhood or their kind of housing, like a single family home, we need to take corrective measures and help them to achieve those goals. That said, Joel, and it's not on you, but it really, you know, you, you have a lot of people saying it was cities and cities kept people out and all of that. If you, uh, there's a really great book called uh, Race for Profit by Kianga Yamada Taylor, which looks at the exclusion of black families, but also in the 60s and 70s when HUD had programs to encourage home ownership, where there was something known as predatory inclusion. Families were being sold terrible houses in awful states, and then were, you know, the, 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 the mortgages were covered by the government. My point is, it really was the real estate industry itself that was largely responsible for these policies because they were just looking to protect property values. And so I think that the narrative that we hear now when people talk to Richard Rothstein and all of that is it's cities' faults. We need to preempt cities. We need to take away local democracy from cities when really it was the real estate industry from top to bottom that was responsible for these exclusionary policies. And, and it's, it's interesting because it is largely you know, Wall Street and developers who are behind this notion that we need to take away local control from cities they're the ones standing in the way of more housing. Well, they're really standing in the way of more profiteering, and that's the urban growth machine at work there. And, and I think we have to be very cognizant. There is an urban growth machine at work, and we really need to be looking and listening to, again, Swedish Greta Thunberg, you know, the Swedish climate activist who warns us against just focusing on money and what she calls fairy tales of eternal economic growth. Which, you know, it's funny, it's because you're actually talking on, you, you broached a subject which I believe we've spoken about on past issues before, which is, you know, you talk about homeless people sleeping in front of a luxury apartment building. I always have had an, I've always had an issue with the fact that we have, we become the society where everything has to be luxury based. It's no longer a matter of like, I need a door that locks, I need a window, a kitchen, indoor plumbing and electric. It's almost like, oh no, I need quartz counters. I need to have a spa on premises. I need an indoor pool. I need to be able to have- Concierge. You know, and so, so, you know, and I understand that, you know, the building side of things have also gotten more expensive, all these things. So it's like what I was trying to get to, I guess, and maybe I, which I think we address as you address as well, which is like our past history did create some of the problems that we're in now. There's no denying that. And I think that that goes from whether it's voting to housing to anything like that. So it's about how do we fix it going forward? And unfortunately, I'm nervous that we're getting into a situation where now we're like, well, we have a housing, we have an affordability issue a huge one but we're trying to say that everything has to be luxury again and well, it's like but but that's, that's the problem that we have because it's it's the problem with neoliberalism and it's this notion which is very bizarre because some of the people who are advocating for these policies like to consider themselves progressive well there's nothing progressive about neoliberalism or these policies that suggest let the market let the unfettered market solve it it's just a question of supply. If you build more, prices will go down. Well, it, 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 that, that is something that is, is, is just an oversimplification. Let's face it, if you build more Porsches, that doesn't reduce the price of Priuses. So the notion of letting the unfettered market try and solve that is, to me, the equivalent of, of letting Philip Morris be in charge of tobacco control. We need more affordable housing, but it needs to be the government itself that subsidizes it and that plans for it. And there are great models like Vienna in Austria, where, where, where I lived also for many years, uh, where, where it can be done. But again, 
we need to stop thinking of people as widgets. This notion that, okay, everyone's going to be happy living in what, what Scott Weiner says are small to mid-sized apartments is nonsense. And part of the environmental problems that we have is if you're going to eliminate the kind of housing that people want most, you're actually forcing them to drive further. And I'll give you an example from Beverly Hills. Our police and our fire department are very well paid. Our firemen earn a total compensation on average per person, not including the chief, of about $340,000 per year. Now, the median household income in Beverly Hills is just a little bit more than $100,000 a year. So each and every one of our firefighters, if they wanted to, could live in Beverly Hills. They couldn't buy a house, but they could live in an apartment, maybe a condo. You want to guess how many of them actually live in town? That's it. None. Zero. None. Oh. None. Not one of them. Why? Zero. Because they want to have houses. Some of them have horse properties out in Simi Valley or Chatsworth or Orange County or even further away. Those are people who are going to pursue that part of their lifestyle choice is what kind of housing they live in. And we need to be as tolerant as we are of people's other lifestyle choices how they dress, who they love, and so on and so forth, about where they live. And as said, so there's unfortunately, though, this almost dogmatic kind of religiosity about how single-family neighborhoods are evil, and they're not. They're as said, they're a choice that, if you look at studies and that sort of thing in polls, many Americans, if they don't live in a single-family home, aspire to. And it doesn't have to be a huge estate. I mean, let, let's remember, and this is something people don't know about Beverly Hills. They think, oh, it's rich. I bet you, Wendy knows, but I bet you, Joy and Joel, you may not know that 65% of our residents live in multifamily housing. Hmm. Over 50% of our residents in Beverly Hills are renters. There are lots, like where I live, that, you know, 4,800 4, square feet. These are not these massive acre properties. And so we really need to be cognizant of, of not ignoring. We talk about supply and demand. You can't ignore, if you're going to believe in that at all, one, you need to segment it. And as you pointed out, if you add another lane to a, a freeway, that sometimes induces traffic. It's something known as induced demand. But we need to be cognizant of the kinds of, of housing that people want. And if we're going to take policies, we should take that into account. Now, again, I believe that this notion of remote work allows a lot of options to allow other communities that have not had the advantages now to thrive, which will be able to offer people a multitude or a lot more lifestyle choices than they had now, where opportunity is over-concentrated in a few super winner areas, if you will. That's a good thing. These are, uh, this means this is the ability for us to, to create more sustainability. Now, for me, it's very clear. You look at the word sustainability, it literally contains the word stability in it. Those letters are all contained in the word sustainability. And to me, stability is also an important part of the concept of sustainability. This notion that we're going to be able to have spirals of eternal growth is to me the definition of unsustainability. And so I, I think that's something we need to come back to because the narrative has gotten so far away from it in California today. I completely agree with that. So one of the things that you and I had previously discussed was tending our own gardens, which I would assume means, you know, being responsible for yourself, being responsible for your own success and not, you know, not supporting massive amounts of consumerism, because in all honesty, you don't need a 20,000 square foot home, in my opinion. It's just that's a lot of empty space. But simultaneously, with the whole social justice aspect, the opportunity for everybody to be educated equally, to have the same opportunities equally, I think is also equally important when respect to tending your own garden. So if you're not given that background, you're kind of at a disadvantage, unfortunately. And um, so I just wanted to kind of throw that in there when you're tending your own garden, it's also making sure you have the same ingredients. <laughs> well, first of all, to tend to, to your own garden, you have to have a garden. I mean, there are people now called no bees, no backyards. I'm not sure that's a good thing. I do believe in an equality of opportunity, but I'm willing to go a step further. I think there's uh, what what philosopher Michael Sandel has called a little bit of a, a tyranny of merit at work now. Uh, we do need to provide everyone with the same opportunities, but people feel they deserve things. People feel they, you know, they've earned it. People, feel, even people who work hard, have advantages 
that other people don't have. And my opinion is, pardon my French, that people don't deserve shit. There may be things people don't deserve. People don't deserve to get sick. They don't deserve to be mistreated and all of that. But this, this sense of entitlement, there needs to be a bit more. And I feel this from Sweden as well. And that's why I consider myself to be a communitarian, a, a sense that we're all in this together and not just some sort of, you know, cutesy kind of cliche, but really meaning it. And so I think we're, you know, one of those, there are a couple of core issues at play there that we're going to have to address as a society. One is income inequality, wherever it may come from, even if someone works hard and, and that sort of thing, do they need to have zillions and zillions of dollars? And um, so we need to, to address the issue of income inequality, I think. Uh, and, and, and those are the, those are key issues. We also need to uh, address this issue of how we share some sort of social responsibility in many ways for each other, that we're looking out for each other, that we are a community. We're not just a, uh, a mix or a mass of individuals who are working together out of pure self-interest. And that kind of civic and moral um, importance or, or, or core is something that this country is missing and losing. And, and part of it is consumerism and money. And the, the, the other thing that is one of the core problems that we have as a society is the fact that our Supreme Court says that money is speech, it's not, and that corporations are people, and they're not. And, and, and those two Supreme Court decisions, from my perspective, are, are behind the, the root of so many bad decisions that we have that are contributing to income inequality and to all of the things that we think are bad in this country. And I, I personally believe that, although it's not perfect, it's not utopia, it's not a paradise, there is so much that we can and should be learning from Sweden in terms of values, in terms of the way of looking at things, in terms of this notion that Sweden has always had for years, going back to a, a Swedish politician called Per Alden Hansson, Folkhemet, the people's home. It's like our country is a home that we live in together. We're family in a way. And that's how we should be looking at things. And we're, we're going so far away from that that I think it, it's one of the things that we see that is dividing society and is creating all of these divisions that we see, you know, in so many ways. And uh, I think we have to get back to basics. And as said, I, I'll go back to looking at many of the things that Michael Sandel points out, that we need to develop a civic core and a, we need to develop some sort of sense of social responsibility that I think we did have at this country at one point, despite the fact that individualism has always been something that has been valued here and it should it needs to be a combination i love the international aspect you bring to this that is something that i don't think many people have considered especially i mean i'm swedish whole family's from sweden so i do have an affiliation with that although i don't speak the language and you've called me out on that i don't even know how to say my own last name but aside from that i love bringing in that we're all in this together so many people don't realize that, you know, they're thinking, no, that I'm going to, I'm going to protect myself and my own family. The rest of you all can just go ahead. So, so you even saw there was some mayor in Texas who, when they were going through the cold spell now and the grid was failing, who, who made some ridiculous statement about how it's up to us to protect ourselves and you can't expect the government or other people to look out for you. I, I think he ended up resigning and rightly so. But the problem is we often do hear and have heard during the pandemic this sort of, hey, we're all in it together, you know, almost as if it's sort of some sort of an ad tagline or something. We just don't mean it enough in America and we need to put it into action a lot more. And we need to understand that in communities, to me, this is why I believe that communities are the solution to our problems and not the, the cause of our problems as some in Sacramento would say. When you're living in a community, you're living together with people almost as a kind of extended family. This is one of the things I love about Beverly Hills and you live here. I grew up here, I went to high school here. It's always felt to me like Mayberry RFD on our best days. On our worst days, we're like Peyton Place in an Ibsen play with Shakespeare thrown in. But you know what, that's every community. All communities on their best days are like Mayberry. And that's what we need to do is empower communities to be the best versions of themselves and that means treating people almost like an extended family. And so rather than having top down from Washington or from Sacramento policies that are meant to be one size fits all, 
because one size doesn't fit all and it's not good to try and make one size fits all to empower communities to be the best versions of their, their selves and for us to create a community of communities. That's how we're going to solve our problems. And uh, we're unfortunately, you know, a ways away from that. And uh, we, we are unfortunately, as said, beset by a politics and a policy of entitlements. And rather than this sort of, you know, tyranny of, of, of entitlement or tyranny of merit, we need to go back to some sort of notion of civic life, of shared responsibility. I totally agree with that. We are coming up to our 30 minute um, ending. So thank you so much for your time. But I do want to end it with, you know, thanking you, but also bringing to light, looking out for each other. I think that's for me, the most important thing that we need to kind of revert back to the way things were in the 50s or 60s. You know, that idealism that everybody was a community, everybody looked out for each other. I wasn't back there back then, but this is my understanding of it. But we do need to revert back to that. It cannot just be about me and my things and my stuff and stay away. It has to be, okay, I may have a little more, so let's share or let's look out for each other. Or let, you know, how can I help you, especially in a pandemic where a lot of people are struggling right now. So well, uh, go ahead. Where, where your neighbors I, offer to help, but their help is in the form of sending an Amazon delivery, as opposed to taking you to the, an older lady to the grocery store, or it, it's just changed. It's just really shifted. Well, and, shift. and, and I would say we need to be more Swedish. Now, again, no, you know, no false utopian sort of notion of what Sweden is. Sweden itself has in many ways regressed. But I'm, I'm going back to what I believe are core Swedish values. And, and this is one of the reasons I loved living in Sweden. I'm proud that I am a Swedish citizen, is those core values are, so. and by the way, it's not a socialistic country. People are like, well, it's socialism. It's absolutely not. And there are things that can improve there, but that notion that we're in it together, that this is the people's home and that it's our community, that's what we need to go back to. And I, I believe as said, the best way of establishing that is is you know not through some globalistic brotherhood of man. It starts at home. It's tending to our own gardens. It's it's within our own communities. It's got to be ground up and not top down. That is very true. Ground up and not top down is brilliant. I'm going to use that from now on. So thank you. We we've gone we've gone over. But thank you. I mean, this has been an incredibly important conversation. I hope that we can have you back. Maybe as things you know, as the pandemic winds down and we're getting back to quote unquote normal, we can see where these are going. We can see this first mile, last mile issue, the transportation, the working remote, proper salaries. Um, on that, I will let Joy say goodbye. I'll let Joel say goodbye. So go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, John. And I love the background. I assume that's uh, pre Beverly Hills or something. Where, what's your background on your background screen? That's actually something maybe for another subject. It's the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite. Ah. It's a very, it's, it is an issue of utmost environmental social justice. It is a valley which John Muir, the founder of the Sierra Club, said was as beautiful as the Yosemite Valley itself. It's been underwater for 100 years because they dammed it, and it's now used as a source of water for San Francisco. It is completely possible to remove the dam without losing a drop of water and allow the American people access to this treasure of our national, one of our greatest national parks. It's the Hetch Hetchy Valley and it needs to be restored. And, and it might be the, a, a good subject for a, a future episode because it is one of the most glaring sort of incidents of despoiling a national park. And uh, you wanna talk about being able to create a restoration of environmental justice. It's the Hetch Hetchy Valley. I love that. Awesome, love that. thank you again. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, sure. thank you so much. This was a, this was a really good Good fun chat. This was awesome. Yeah, Thank very you. educational. So I, I will be following up with you on the Hatch Hatch Dam because I know about that. It's a, it is a big issue with environmental social justice. So I'm going to call on you when you're coming back, whether you like it or not. <laughs> well, that's good. And in fact, there's a wonderful organization that I've you know been in touch with, and I, I've I've ri actually written an op-ed um, called Restore Hatch Hatchy, and that is their goal. And and I, I do think that you might want to include the executive director who's someone named Spreck Rosencrantz and he would be a great guest because this is something that people don't know about and they should. I, I'm sure all of you have been to Yosemite and love it and it's one of the most magical places on earth. The notion that there is another valley 
like the Yosemite Valley, as you can see in the background, as beautiful as it was, uh, that is underwater now, that, that this is something that no one is talking about or very few people are talking about uh, is, is pretty much a scandal. Unbelievable. No, definitely, definitely want to discuss that. But thank you so much. Yes. We will definitely be doing this again because I definitely want to learn more. And thank you. Appreciate your time. And we will catch you guys next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a great week, everyone. Stay safe. Thanks so much, everyone.